is God's law in us. Uh, so, um, and I mentioned that there is a theology of sacramentality that focuses on Jesus as the great sacrament of the Father, and the church as the great sacrament of Jesus. So all seven sacraments point us to that great mystery of Christ. Now, tonight, I want to say a few words before I go into specific sacraments. And uh, I've written all seven of the sacraments, properly speaking, on the board. So we have three sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. We're going to be looking at those a little bit tonight. Uh, two sacraments of healing and forgiveness, which are penance or uh, reconciliation, and the anointing of the sick. And we'll be talking about those next week. And then sacraments of um, marital matrimony and holy orders, which would be priests, deacons, and bishops in the church. So those are the seven sacraments. Those are a vocation or commitment, uh, the ordering of the church life of the Christian community and the church. Um, but before we jump into the sacraments of initiation tonight, I want to flesh out for a moment that little part of the definition of sacrament. So instituted by Christ. Um, one theologian said that every sacrament is an encounter with the risen Lord of Jesus. So if we look at each of the seven sacraments, all of them can find an origin in the life and ministry of Jesus. So let's try to make some of those connections. So how would you associate baptism with Jesus? Anybody in your scriptures or your testimony? All right, so Jesus is indeed baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And uh, the early church fathers will say, he went into the, you know, John was baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. We believe that Jesus himself is without sin. So the fathers of the early church said, why did he do it? And their answer was to make the water ready for us. So to be in solidarity with sinful humanity. So, but there's also, um, there's also a moment, if you remember, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 20, 28, um, where the resurrected Jesus appears. We went through this when we were talking about the mission of the church. And Jesus says, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is a direct link to Jesus himself telling the apostles to baptize in the name of the Trinity. So baptism is intimately linked with the person of Jesus. Now what about confirmation? Which we, uh, we really focus in confirmation, which is a sealing of baptism. We'll look at that tonight. Uh, sacred chrism is used and the laying on of hands uh, we really focus on the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here, uh, if you remember again, John's Gospel, the risen Lord Jesus breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And very early in the Christian church, uh, you see the apostles uh, laying hands on new Christians to communicate the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we root the giving of Jesus, Jesus giving of the Spirit, as the origin of confirmation. What about the Eucharist? This one is pretty obvious, right? At the Last Supper, Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood, do this in memory of me. So, very clear connection to Jesus. What about, um, as we look at sacraments, of healing and forgiveness. Any evidence in the four Gospels that the ministry of Jesus includes healing the sick? Well, all through all four Gospels, right? So at the core of Jesus' ministry is making people healed and whole. And the deepest wounding of human beings is, is what we call the wounding of sin that separates them from the mystery of God. So, any evidence that Jesus uh, focused on forgiveness of sins in the Gospels? 
got all the way through all four Gospels, right? Forgiveness, reconciliation is an intimate part of Jesus' entire ministry. So when the church continues to anoint the sick and to reconcile sinners, it is continuing the very mission of the life of Jesus. Or what about um, marriage? Any connection with Jesus and marriage? And you're going to point out the most classic case of that. It's probably what you're going to do first, right? What is that? Or right, Jesus, yeah, he went to a wedding at Cana where he transformed water into wine. Um, that's interesting. If you study the Gospel of John with some care, uh, what you see in the Gospel of John is that Jesus takes all of the ancient symbols and signs of the Jewish faith and shows that he far exceeds what had prepared for that moment. So the purification judge used in the Jewish faith to represent purification or transfigured at the wedding feast of Cana into not only wine, but the best wine. And the best wine was saved till the end. The wine is really a symbol of Jesus himself. Uh, so the Father waited until the fullness of time to send his own beloved Son, who is the true bridegroom of the church. So if you want to look at the bond with marriage, you have to see that a love affair between Jesus and his people and the Father and his people the bond between the bride and bridegroom is the essence of love, which is the dying of Jesus on the cross. So it's intimately bound up with self-giving love, which marriage is at its heart is self-giving love and open to the gift of life. So it's uh, also thread through the life of Jesus, not simply that he was a Cana uh, for a wedding. And last but not least, any evidence in the life and ministry of Jesus that he was preparing the church for leadership. Or Peter, yes for sure, that would be uh, the Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, the Apostle. But also, in the very act of selecting 12 Apostles from among all of his followers, he is structuring the new Christian community with leadership. So that's a prepared by Jesus himself. So it's, I think it's easy when you understand the purpose of the sacraments to see that they all flow out of the very life and ministry of the person of Jesus himself. So when we say instituted by Christ, it doesn't mean that you're always going to find seven different times in the Gospels where he says, be sure and anoint the sick, uh, or be sure and do this or that. He simply is the will of the Father made flesh, and the church continues that, that core ministry of Jesus. All right, questions or comments about that before we dive a little deeper tonight into the sacraments of initiation? Yes? How much does an individual's faith play into the sacraments, if any? All seven sacraments are sacraments of faith. Uh, St. Augustine was very clear about that. So they depend upon the faith of the church in addition to God's action in those sacraments. So um, there's nothing magic about the sacraments. Like if I were to pour water over someone's head and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we don't intend to baptize the person. The person is not baptized. So it, it requires water, it requires that language, but it also requires the intention to do what the church does, which is a sacrament of faith. So it's, it's really what we call the faith of the church. In the case of an adult who chooses baptism, it is. A person's faith is inter integrally involved in the sacrament. So, if an adult here or two, right, or going to be baptized at Easter Vigil, your faith um, is part of an essential part of that sacrament. So, we'll ask you, do you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And you have to say, I do. You know, so your personal faith matters. Now, what about when we baptize a baby or an infant? So, the parents and the godparents 
on behalf of the child uh, give testimony to faith on being, and it's the faith of the church which they embody, which is gathered. So we're baptizing in the faith of the church at that moment. But you have to be in, in the Latin rite, which is what we're part of, the Roman Catholic Latin rite, you have to be of uh, old enough of, of, of conscious um, understanding to receive the Eucharist and to be confirmed and to receive reconciliation and to be anointed. So in the Eastern Church, in the Eastern Rites, even infants receive the Eucharist. So um, they, they dip the, uh, a, a silver spoon in the precious blood of a fragment of the body of Christ. So when a baby is baptized, they're immediately confirmed and receive first holy communion all at once as a baby. Yeah, good question about faith. Yeah, the church without faith wouldn't have sacraments, right? So an integral part. So that leads me to um, to a beginning of these sacraments of initiation. So um, in the ancient church, um, when the good news about Jesus was proclaimed by the apostles, the earliest Christians, and you read this in the Acts of the Apostles, they proclaim the good news of Jesus who has died and risen from the dead, and you'll hear in those narratives, and this was often the case in the early church, when the gospel was proclaimed and heard, and a person responded with faith, then they were baptized. So often immersed in the water, the word baptized literally means to be immersed, in the Greek word for baptism, into the water. So that is, in a sense, the fullest science. When you immerse an entire body into the water, there's a great power in that symbolism. We'll talk about what's required for validity in a minute, but if I forget, remind me, please. But the fullest symbol is that truly plunging the person into water. Um, and so then, immediately, they also hands were laid, and the Holy Spirit, uh, what we would call today confirmation, the sealing of that baptism with the sacred chrism. So I mentioned last week uh, the book, The Doors to the Sacred by Joseph Martos, which is kind of a history of each of the seven sacraments. And um, so what he does is early, when he's speaking about baptism, he refers to uh, many of the texts that were used in the ancient centuries of the church of theologians who spoke about what happened at baptism and how it was understood. Now, if you read Paul's letters, what does Paul say about baptism? He says, when you were baptized, you died. You died to yourself, you died to sin, and you rose with Christ in baptism. So, baptism for Paul is an entrance into what we call the Paschal mystery of Jesus dying and rising. So, as we have died with Christ, we also rise with Christ. So the symbolism of going down to the water is kind of a death. Rising up out of the water is a powerful symbol of resurrection, rising with Christ. So the connection with the Paschal mystery, you have been buried with Christ in baptism. You have risen with Christ. That's the way Paul speaks about the sacrament of baptism. So um, it's really a death to sin, it's a death to self, and in the sense that the self has become alienated or separated from God, and the rising with Christ as a new creation. So we are, Paul speaks about it, when, we're, when we are claimed by Christ and baptized into Christ, we become new creatures. He will say the Holy Spirit has been poured into our hearts so we can cry out, Abba, Father, we are now the beloved daughters and the beloved sons of God. So Joseph Martos in his book describes uh, how baptism took place in the ancient church. And I want to read a little section of that. Um, 
he speaks about how they went through a lengthy period. So you get the impression when you read the Acts of the Apostles that the gospel was proclaimed, someone was moved to faith, and immediately they're baptized. And many of those people who first heard the gospel were Jewish, so they had a rich understanding of God's ways. They knew the great moral tradition of God's people, the Ten Commandments. They knew the writings of the prophets. They knew how God had revealed himself through Moses. So, you know, they had a rich preparation. So when Peter and the other apostles said, this Jesus whom you put to death, God has raised from the dead, and now if you believe in him, you will be forgiven. That catechesis, that apostolic catechesis, that moved people to faith to follow Jesus, that was enough preparation. Uh, when Christianity moved a little bit beyond its Jewish roots uh, into the early centuries, remember that for the first 300 years or so, uh, to be Christian in the Roman Empire was not legal. Now, there were times when the church lived in relative peace under the Roman emperors, and other times when it experienced great persecution. Sometimes persecution was more intense than one part of the empire, and for that reason, Christians had to be discreet and careful. You know, you couldn't be publicly Christian at times without repercussions. The repercussions might be anything from being dismissed from the service of the government or the army to uh, torture or death in the most extreme form. So the Christian community gathered for the most part in those earliest centuries in house churches. Uh, and house churches, if you, if you want to look at the ancient Roman uh, homes, were often you know, shaped like a rectangle with a courtyard on the inside, would have a a, a large table. The Christian community would have gathered around the table to celebrate what we call the Eucharist today. And they would have been very careful about letting people know what they were doing. So they didn't publicize on the local news channels, hey, we're having Mass at 6 o'clock at so-and-so's house. You know, you had to know someone by the word of mouth. So how did Christianity spread? It spread by personal witness and personal example. So people would tell their friends and colleagues, you know, I found a new life. Things have changed. I'm a different person. Well, what happened? And they would begin to tell the story. Well, I'm part of this Christian community. So, um, so Marto says, if they were attracted by what they saw of the Christian way of life, they first had to find a member of the Christian community who would sponsor them during a period of moral formation. So a sponsor in the ancient Christian church, you all have sponsors, was your representative, your link with the community. The person would say to the Christian community, this person is trustworthy, that we can bring them into the community. They would also be a witness to the journey or to the acquirer of the candidate, that yes, this is what my life is all about, which share freely what their faith was all about. So those who sought baptism were also called to what we call moral conversion. So if they had been living a life that was not morally good, they had to let go of those past sins. So if they'd been living promiscuity or idolatry, worshiping other gods, the Roman gods, they had to renounce uh, belief in other gods. They had to renounce adultery. They had to renounce uh, violence. And in the earliest Christian community in the first few centuries, the Christian church was predominantly following in the footsteps of Jesus, a pacifist church. So when you read the story of St. Martin and his conversion, um, he was a soldier in the Roman Empire, and he had to leave the Roman army to become a catechumen, which he chose to do. So you had to uh, experience what we would call today a significant moral conversion willing to let go of my old way of life and to embrace this new way of life. Now we'll also mention St. Hippolytus did say that, that those who died before they were baptized or were martyred for believing in Christ need not worry about their eternal salvation because their blood was their baptism if they died for the faith before 
water baptism. So when they were accepted as candidates, they began their doctrinal instructions during the final weeks. They were instructed daily and their life examined. Uh, toward the end of that preparation, they were given two things that were sacred to the Christian community. One was the Lord's Prayer. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. So we're given the Our Father as a way of praying. They were also given what we would call today the Apostles' Creed. The, these are our core beliefs that you will be baptized into. In the days before their baptism, they fasted from food to have a more complete dependence on God. And on the great vigil of the feast of the Christian Passover, of the vigil of Easter, Christ's Passover from death to life, they kept vigil throughout the night. So uh, the night before Easter Sunday, uh, they would begin an all-night vigil. You can still, by the way, go to some monasteries in the church where they begin a vigil when darkness falls, and they read the entire book of Psalms, all 150, all night long, and they do great readings from sacred scripture, so a liturgy of the word goes on throughout the darkness of night. Then, in the early morning light, the bishop and his assistants went to the cistern or baptismal pool. Later, when Constantine allows Christians to be legally accepted, they are able to build churches, and often they would build baptistries, separate buildings with a baptismal pool. One by one, they were stripped naked, the men assisted by deacons, the women by deaconesses, and they would be asked, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do, and they were plunged into the water. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? And a second time, plunged in the water. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the church, the resurrection of the body, and so forth? And a third time, they were plunged. Now, prior to that moment of being plunged in the water, they would often face the west, the direction of the setting sun, and they would be asked to renounce evil and sin and Satan any connection with the world of darkness, and as they made their baptismal promises, they would face the direction of the east or the rising sun to make their, their promises, baptismal promises. Once they were immersed in the pool, they were anointed with sacred chrism on, on the forehead coming out of the water by the bishop. They were given a white garment to wear to represent they have now clothed themselves in Christ, and they would be led to the place where the Christian community would be celebrating the mystery of the Eucharist. Now, at that point in the early church, no person who was not fully Christian, fully baptized and confirmed, was even permitted to attend the Eucharist. So they could not experience the sacred mysteries unless they were fully initiated. So that night, those who were baptized in the water and sealed with confirmation were allowed for the first time to the Eucharistic table of the Lord Jesus. And there for the first time they also received what we call today Holy Communion, Body and Blood of the Lord. So this was the great night of Christian initiation. And I think the description that he gives is very helpful for two reasons. Of one, it kind of gives you a good sense of the theology of the sacraments of initiation, what is baptism about, what is confirmation about, and the gift of receiving the Lord for the first time in the Eucharist. They form a unified liturgical experience when they're celebrated that way. I mentioned that the Eastern churches still baptize, confirm, and give first Eucharist to infants, but also uh, for those of you who are going to become Catholic uh, at the Easter Vigil, if you've never been baptized, you will experience, in a very similar fashion, all three sacraments that evening. So you will be baptized, you will be confirmed, and you will receive your first Holy Communion. So you're going to be mirroring in the presence of the whole Christian community what the early church did. Now I want to, at a quick aside, Sometimes people ask, when did the church begin then to baptize, for example, infants or children too young to understand what was happening? 
And uh, when you read about in the Acts of the Apostles, that uh, entire households were converted to the faith, the presumption in the ancient church was the father of the family was the pater familias in the Roman Empire. So if he elected to become Christian, usually the entire household, did, the women and the children, including the infants, the entire family would be initiated. And often, also by the way, if they had slaves or servants, they would be part of that as well. So they're considered members of the household in the broad sense of that word. So, um, so there's no reason to assume that they, even the children were not baptized at that point as members of those households. Now later, um, in the fourth century, in the 300s, and here this is also important to remember, we'll be talking about this with the order of penitence. One of the great powerful effects of baptism is that when you're baptized, all of your sins, your past sins, are forgiven. You are washed clean. So, and there are two types, I'm going to break this down simply right now, two types of sin. All of us human beings uh, were marked uh, with what we call original sin. So that original turning from God that we read about in the narrative in Genesis of humans turning from God, that has rippled out to touch every human being except for Mary and Jesus. So well. Uh, there are exceptions to the general rule, but all the rest of us, when we're conceived, we bear uh, that original sin. So baptism washes that original sin away. And, and if we are old enough to have committed any personal sins, and, and uh, we have the freedom to choose to do God's will, we chose not to, then it also washes away all of our sins. So both the minor ones that are part of everyday living, and also even the greatest of sins. So even murder and prostitution and adultery and uh, idolatry and uh, the greatest of sins, baptism wash it. You're a new creature. And we Catholics teach that God is working in that sacrament and God is the one who makes us a new creature. So the waters of baptism God is using as an instrument, and the priest who is ordained in the person of Jesus is acting as an instrument through which God is working. So all sin is forgiven. We are clothed in Christ to become new creatures. We are now members of the household of faith of God's church, or God's beloved sons and daughters. And within us now dwells the Trinity itself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now dwell within the newly baptized. So um, some of the Protestant reformers believed that the salvation of Christ made us in the eyes of God justified, but they didn't really change us within. The Catholic and the ancient Christian belief has always been no, the work of God really does make us new. We're made new creatures uh, in Christ. So we have been clothed in Christ now. We bear Christ. We are Christ the bearers once we are baptized. We are chrismated in confirmation. The word chrism, chrismation or confirmation, is connected to the name Christ, the anointed one, Son, by the Father. So we're bound to Christ uh, intimately in the Spirit and to the Father. So we're now members of the church set free from sin. So profound. And at the night of the Easter Vigil, you will hear of the blessing of water. And the blessing of water at the Easter Vigil, and at any time we bless water, it goes all the way back to how the Spirit hovered over the waters of creation. The waters of the great flood of Noah made a new beginning. And the waters of the Red Sea, through which God's people crossed over on dry land. So it refers back to those epic moments that include water in the history of God's people, and it also refers us to the baptism of Christ in the Jordan River, and the water and the blood that flowed from the side of Christ on the cross, and it references the command of the risen Lord, go baptize. So the blessing of water that evening, pay attention to it, especially if you're going to be baptized. Now what we will do, those of you who will be baptized, we're going to invite you to make your baptismal promises, 
those of you who will be confirmed but have already been baptized and the rest of God's people are invited to renew your baptismal promises. So it's a night where we all say yes again to God for the first time in baptism or as a reminder of our baptismal commitments. And once we baptize the adults here at St. Henry, the ritual calls for the, the sprinkling right to go up throughout the church, sprinkling everybody with blessed water. But, you know, we have a big church at St. Henry, and I can't sprinkle all the way across those long views. So what we typically invite people to do is actually approach the font after baptism and bless yourself with a newly blessed water. So we invite the whole community to touch the blessed water. So um, when a baby is baptized, it's interesting. But you'll see at the Easter Vigil, the Paschal candle, which represents Christ risen from the dead. That's a powerful part of the liturgy, that not the liturgy of light. And all the baptized will light candles, little tapers from the Christ candle, and carry them into the darkened church. So the whole church is illuminated by those tapers. But when a baby is baptized, a candle is lit from the Easter candle, and the deacon or priest doing the baptizing says, Dear parents and godparents, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. This child of yours has been enlightened by Christ and is always to walk as a child of the light. May she keep the flame of faith alive in her heart, and when the Lord comes, may she go out to meet him with all the saints in his heavenly kingdom. It's a good little catechesis on what just happened to that baby. So we think about that, we're thinking, well, those of you who are already baptized, you're thinking, I'm renewing my baptismal promises, I will approach the water, and I will bless myself. And then you will see that the newly baptized will return to the church here at St. Henry, and they'll light garments, uh, as they did in the ancient church, and you'll see them with their lighted candles. So beautiful symbolism that uh, flows throughout the liturgy that night, which all speaks about what baptism is really all about. We say that baptism uh, marks the soul with an indelible mark. So once you are claimed by Christ in baptism, you forever are marked with Christ. Even if you gravely sin, you're never rebaptized. Now that's where I went a few minutes ago. I mentioned uh, in the 300s, the Christian community got a bit worried about, well, what if I do get baptized and then I commit some grave sin afterwards? Because the order of penitence in the fourth century was still very difficult to go through the only at once. So what they began to do in many cases is they'd say, well, I'm, I'm a member of the church, I'm a catechumen, I believe in Christ, but I'm not going to be baptized until I'm close to death, just in case. That way I'll be forgiven before I die, which we missed the whole purpose. The baptism gives us the grace of God, you know, we can live by throughout our whole lives. So, so when you read the story, if you, if you don't know the story of St. Ambrose, one of the great fathers of the early church, the Bishop of Milan, at that time, the, the power of Milan was greater than Rome in the secular world. I think the emperor even spent all of his time there. And so Ambrose was the governor and, uh, and Milan was a believer in Christ but had never been baptized. And the bishop died, and they had a meeting in the cathedral, and Ambrose was there to ensure order, and um, they were trying to elect a new bishop in those days. The people of God and the clergy would gather in the cathedral to elect the new bishop. They did that in Rome as well. And um, apparently, as the story goes, a child began to yell, Ambrose for bishop, Ambrose for bishop. And apparently there was a sign like a dove landing on his shoulder that was signified his choice. And he said yes, uh, he was elected, so he had never been baptized. So Ambrose, as an adult, was baptized, he was confirmed, he received his first Eucharist, and he was ordained a priest and bishop all in about a week's time. So he became one of the greatest bishops and teachers of the faith in the ancient church in the first thousand years. He was called um, the honey tongue because his preaching was so eloquent. And he actually converted St. Augustine back to the Christian faith, so by his preaching. So, so the power of the sacraments is great indeed. That's why we don't wait until the dead or death that to get them. So the church did come from 
that century, and it also learned that it needed to deal with sin differently than a rigorous order of penitence. I will talk about that more next week. So, um, so baptism is really, uh, it's the gateway into the Christian life. Um, so how does one baptize? So uh, typically a child uh, or an adult is immersed in water three times and or water can be poured over the head of the person three times and uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when you're baptizing, you use the name of the person, Mark, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and it requires water, it requires that prayer, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it requires the intention to do what the church intends to do when it baptizes. Those are the three essential elements for baptism. Now, why do I mention this? This is an important thing because, believe it or not, even though the bishop or priest or deacon are the ordinary ministers of baptism, the church teaches that any human being, even a non-Christian, can follow the baptize. So let's say you're driving down Highway 70 and you see um, a car accident and you approach the sick person or the injured person on the side of the road and they look up at you and say, I've never been baptized, so I don't want to be baptized before I die. You can, if you have your bottle of water in your car, you can run and get it. You can pour the water over your head and say, What's your name? I'm John. John, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a valid baptism. So there's actually, um, I was talking to somebody this evening, I love backpacking and hiking, so I used to subscribe to Backpacker Magazine. At one time I wrote this article about uh, back in the 1960s in Glacier National Park, um, they changed the way that human beings were relating to grizzly bears, and that summer they had two fatal grizzly bear attacks for the first time in the history of the park. They both happened on the same night. And there was an article that told the story of what happened that night. It happened to be that there was a Jesuit priest who was backpacking in Glacier National Park the night the attack happened. And he was awakened by the commotion and he and others began a search party to look for the victims. And one of the people that they found was a woman who was not dead yet but dying and she had never been baptized. So he baptized her that night in the park. And uh, the article went on to say that, and, uh, that article came out more than 10 years ago, so I don't know if it's still the case, but every single year, that Jesuit would go back to that Glacier National Park and celebrate mass uh, somewhere near that location. So, you know, this is, and also, for example, for those of you who work in a healthcare setting, doctors and nurses and so forth, if there's someone who, um, or like a newborn, that has not been baptized and there's a danger of death, and the parents want a baptism, and it needs to happen quickly, that's why anyone can baptize. So, so um, that's an important remembrance. Now, we, we should also add just the quick aside about what if someone wanted to be baptized and were not able to be before they died. What does the church teach about that? We entrust such persons to God's mercy, right? So we say that even the desire for baptism can have a salvific effect. So uh, God has bound himself to the sacraments, but God is not bound by the sacraments. So God's grace can work beyond the ordinary, usual ways that God does things. So we should trust in God's work for those who died before they were able to be baptized. And that's an important question because, you know, we know today, for example, that many um, pregnancies end in miscarriage. So we should never despair that they, because they didn't get a chance to hear the gospel or be baptized, that, that they're not now with the Lord. We should trust in the great mercy of God in that regard. So, all right. So, um, any questions about baptism? I was thinking of a question that you answered it sort of, if a person was a sinner and out of guilt or whatever, he could not request being baptized a second time? Has that ever been? 
The second baptism has no validity, but then we do what we call the, the sacrament of uh, reconciliation or penance. Sometimes in the ancient church it was called a second baptism, but it's not baptism. It's uh, forgiveness of sin, yeah, for grave sin in the ancient church. It was reserved to grave sin in the ancient church. It's been expanded. We'll talk more about that next week. The sacrament of reconciliation. Um, so I mentioned that in the last, at the, um, in the ancient church, baptism and confirmation all happen together. Uh, so today, if you go to a typical Catholic parish like St. Henry, most of the time, our, our new, new members of our families are baptized as infants, about six weeks old or so. And they're not confirmed until they're in the eighth grade. So that's when their baptism is sealed with the sacred chrism. Well, how did that happen, that those two moments of the ritual got so separated in time? Well, it's interesting, if you study the history of the sacrament of confirmation, and you look at the, the rules or the canons of the church for the first thousand years or, or plus even, um, you see many church councils having very strong word, strongly worded canons telling bishops, you must travel quickly to confirm the newly baptized. Well, why would they keep repeating that over and over through the centuries? It meant that the bishops weren't getting around quickly enough to baptize or to confirm the newly baptized. So, and part of it was, you know, as the Roman Empire began to deteriorate, things travel became more difficult, dioceses were larger. It took the bishop longer to get around to baptize um, the new, to confirm the newly baptized. So that's the sealing of baptism. Originally, what happened within days, we could do it right away or weeks. And in our Latin Rite and Western Church, the sacrament of confirmation was ordinarily reserved to the bishop. And the Eastern Rites, they allow a priest to do it. That's why priests always baptize and confirm together in the Eastern Rites, in the Eastern Churches. So in the West, uh, certainly, you were never to receive Holy Communion before confirmation. So they kept the original ordering, first baptized, then confirmed, and received the Eucharist. And there were canons about that. No one's to be received to the table of the Lord unless they've been properly confirmed. So, but as time went on and months grew into years, eventually they began to allow children um, who were conscious that they were receiving the Lord of the Eucharist they allowed them to approach the table of the Lord once they were old enough to understand what it was. And in some of those cases, they had not yet been confirmed. So that's how gradually confirmation migrated after First Communion. And, but even in the early 20th century, uh, throughout much of the church, it usually happened shortly after First Communion, like in the third grade. So we only saw migrating up to the upper middle school grades and, and really in the last hundred years or so. And uh, by the time the Second Vatican Council happened, many catechists began to even say, let's wait until they're adolescents and they can understand better what they're doing. So many dioceses in the country actually waited until their junior year of high school. So now we have a whole age of ranges across the United States. And Rome said we had to pick one age and the bishops said, well, let's keep the range. And they said, no, it has to be one age. And the bishops couldn't agree with each other, so they said, let's keep a range. And I said, no, you have to pick an age. And they said, we can't, we haven't been able to figure it out. And I said, okay, so we still have a, a, a range of ages. Eighth grade is the most normal in the country right now. Uh, but I do try to remind um, our parents and our catechists that this is the ceiling of baptism, because what happened was, when it moved to the eighth grade or high school, you know, well-meaning catechists said, this is probably an adolescent right of adult mature commitment to the faith. So now these are going to be adults for Christ. So it's a, a sacrament of transition into adulthood. That's totally made up. It's not anything in the ancient tradition about confirmation. It's just a catechetical tool that catechists developed primarily in the 20th century. So, and uh, so it's not a, uh, and you know, we have to be careful in our confirmation programs because we ask kids to do service and all that. We don't want to give the impression that you have to do a certain number of service hours to earn confirmation, right? It is a gift of God just like baptism is. And when you are baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, so it's a deepening of that gift. 
and a sealing of that gift. And we also only do it one time. Uh, now the bishop can delegate a priest to confirm, and that often happens. And the night of the Easter Vigil, any adult who is baptized, or anyone baptized for the first time as a Catholic, is also can be confirmed at the same time. So even children who are younger than eighth grade. Uh, Father, do uh, godparents need to be Catholic? Godparents, so everyone who is to be baptized has a godfather and a godmother normally. And normally, your godparents, your godmother and your godfather, should be practicing Catholics. But the Catholic Church does permit, just as people have you know, a very dedicated Christian who is not in the Catholic Church, but they would like to serve as a Christian witness. So as long as one of the two is Catholic, the other may serve as a Christian witness. So you want at least one Catholic godparent. Um, so with confirmation, um, the two is unrepeatable. You're only confirmed once in your life. The ordinary minister in the Roman Rite is the bishop. And uh, the two elements that are essential are the chrism itself that the bishop um, consecrates. And the language that is spoken when you mark the forehead is uh, Mary is sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the cross is marked on the forehead with uh, the sacred chrism. There's also an extension of hands over those to be confirmed and an invocation of the Holy Spirit. So what we call the laying on of hands and the sealing of the sacred chrism are the two most ancient gestures associated with that sacrament. All right, questions about confirmation. All right, the third, yes? Okay, so what about the name? So everyone who is confirmed will be confirmed with a name. So my baptismal name, my birth name is James Mark, both great saints. And in those days, the priest encouraged us that we had good saint names that we liked to also use them for confirmation. So I was also confirmed as James Mark. So I was confirmed with the baptismal name. So if you have the same name, and you like her saint, I encourage you to keep that baptismal connection. Now, I have some nieces and nephews who have names that have no Christian associations. So, in cases like that, it would be helpful to have a saint name for confirmation. So, um, or let's say, let's say your name is, is Mary, but you've always had a particular devotion to St. Teresa of this little flower. And you just, she's been a Christian and you emulated, and you really want to be confirmed with her, then pick Therese Perez, and pick that name of the saint that you admire. And technically, you don't even have to pick one of the same sex, so if you are a woman and you love St. Francis of Assisi, and you want to be confirmed as Francis, you can be confirmed as Francis. So even though she's Why don't you so, so, so the idea is, in theory, that when we're baptized and confirmed, we're really being joined to the communion of saints, to those who are claimed by Christ. And we have these marvelous exemplary examples of the Christian life through the centuries. But I mean, here's the funny thing: like Mark, for example, became a gospel writer, but that name is a pagan name before. Mark was an evangelist, so based on the, the Roman god of the war, Mars. Right? So in the beginning, none of the names were Christian. Now, some of them were Jewish, so they would have been like Abraham or Joshua, so they might have been baptized with that. But over the centuries, it was a custom that's developed. Don't, don't Tradition. Do we also, do we also um, trust that our uh, Catholic Church Yes, we will talk a bit more about saints one evening and Mary. But one of the core things that there are two elements about saints that we Catholics emphasize, well, three really, 
One is that we're still in communion with them, we're still in a living relationship. The second is there are examples that we emulate because they follow Christ in some extraordinary way. And third, we believe that they're still interceding on our behalf, so there are intercessors in heaven. Uh, the Pilgrim Church is being prayed over by the saints who are already with the Lord in heaven. So if you claim a saint, and you have a devotion to a saint, you're trusting that they're praying for you on the journey. And even though I was baptized as James Morgan, and confirmed as James Morgan, I have other favorite saints, so when I'm preaching and I need particular help with an important homily, I will ask St. Ambrose to pray for me. I have a strong connection to St. Ambrose. Or St. John Chrysostom, the great preacher for Augustine. So. I just have to share with you something that my husband told me that um, he encourages people to think about choosing a minor saint's name because the major saints are, are awfully busy up here. <laughs> <laughs> some of those minor saints. Well, I'll tell you, some of our kids do choose minor names. I've never even heard of those saints. I'm like, it's so minor and I don't know how to pronounce for sure. Can you say that name? So, um, but it should be somebody that you feel that you want to get to know more closely and feel inspired by. And that might be a minor saint. So, that was. Those major saints might be busy. <laughs> but Ambrose and John Chrysostom have come through for me when I ask for anything on all this. So I was asked the Holy Spirit, of course. So, and Jesus himself. So, so I don't, you know, why should I go to saints when I have Jesus? I'm like, well, we ask each other to pray to Jesus. So I'd ask those who are the Lord and have to pray for us too. So. Um, okay, third sacrament of initiation. And I'll probably circle back a little bit next week as we're a little bit closing because we started late tonight. I didn't have to come like to start early time. Um, so the sacrament of the Eucharist. It is a sacrament of initiation, so we receive it as after we're baptized and confirmed. But it is one of these repeatable sacraments that we receive throughout our life. So it is our uh, food for the journey. And even uh, we said the last sacrament can be what we call um, the Eucharist as what we call viaticum, which is food for the final journey into heaven. So when a person is dying, there's nothing more beautiful than for the, one of the last things they experience, but to receive the body of the Lord before they make that journey to be home forever with Christ. And, um, you know, we did a walk through the Mass. I was not here that evening, but I did want to just do a few highlights about the Eucharist. We as Catholic Christians, going all the way back to the very beginning, so when Jesus said, this is my body, and the Semitic word body means this is me, given for you. This is my blood. He said this at the Last Supper. We have it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul. And blood was also my life poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We believe that every time we celebrate the Eucharist, that the bread and wine truly become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So, no longer ordinary bread and wine, this is now Christ the Lord, who became God, who became human for us. We receive as food to nourish our bodies and to transform us. That is an incredible mystery, isn't it? You know, I've grown up believing this all my life, but there's some days when I sit there and I think, you know, the infinite creator of the whole universe, that this God chose first to become human, like you and me. If you and I were to freely choose, we can't do it, but if we freely choose to become an ant or an amoeba, what God did is greater still, that the infinite God would become human and take on the limitations of the creature that's utterly astounding to me, right, if you really think about it. And yet he chooses also to come to us in this hidden form of bread and wine, veiled under sacramental signs to be our food. And, you know, the, the St. Thomas Aquinas was the one who said, you know, this is a mystery that our senses can't tell us. There is no change in the physical properties of these elements. Physically and chemically, they're still bread and wine. It's not a physical change, 
It's a metaphysical change, a very change of what it is. And it's very reality, very essence. So the best way to describe it is, if I go outside on a hot sunny day and I stay out there too long, what happens to me? I get burned. My skin turns bright red. That's a physical change. But I'm still the same human being. Now, we can't do this. Only God can do this. But if I were to go outside and come back in, and I'm no longer Mark Beckman, but another human being, but I still have the same physical body, no physical change has taken place, but a change in reality has taken place. Well, that's the stuff of fiction for a human being, right? So God alone can, can change reality, uh, change the true reality of what it is. So how can one accept this? St. Thomas Aquinas says, by faith alone. Right? We, we can only believe this is truly the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, through faith. Can't prove it physically, can't prove it in any other way except accepting it in faith. So um, that's why we treat the Eucharist with such great reverence. You notice that after the words of Jesus are spoken from the Last Supper, that the priest genuflex or bows. Um, Christ is here present now. This is no longer what it was when we brought it up the aisle. This is now Christ. So we consume it as sacred food. It is God we receive. I receive the living God. And I receive the Eucharist. And what happens is it changes us. Who was it? John, were you the one telling me you asked the question of a doctor or a scientist about what happens to food in your body? Did you ask me that question? No, it was someone else. He asked me, a person asked me the question. He asked this doctor, he says, doctor, he goes, I have a question for you. He says, when I eat a cracker, he didn't ask about the Eucharist. He was asking about ordinary food. He said, if I eat a cracker, put it in my mouth, what happens to that cracker in my body? And the doctor said, well, it gets converted into energy. That's what happens to food in our body. So he, that made him think about the Eucharist differently because he thought that you know, the energy is the energy of Christ. So once Christ enters into us, it's Christ is transforming us through his presence and energy with that. You know, the scholastic fathers that are trying to figure out, well, if this really is Christ and I receive Christ, how long does that remain Christ in me before it's not Christ anymore? And the best answer they could come up with is as long as it has the form of that it had before, the form of bread or wine, it's still Christ. So they so they guessed, well, I don't know what a doctor would say today, if any doctors let me know. But they would say, well, the scholastics made a guess, it's about 20 minutes before, you know, it's no longer the Eucharist. So when you think about it that way, just a quick aside, we're all like bearers of Christ after we receive the We've got a church full of tabernacles, right? We're all holding the risen Christ. So we should remember that when we're leaving church, right? Where we treat each other. So, um, yeah, so we become bearers of Christ and come to Christ is transforming us more and more into himself if we cooperate. So it is a sacrament of faith. We do believe. And, uh, but whether I believe or not, if it's a valid Eucharist, it happens. It really is Christ. So there's lots of stories from the medieval period of what they call Eucharistic miracles about, for example, priests who didn't believe it was really the body and blood of Christ, and they began to believe, you know, or something dramatic to show the priest this is really. And there is a story in um, O Cibrero in Spain. Um, I think it's Mary that this priest uh, had this uh, thought about somebody approaching the Eucharist, and the thought was, oh, this beggar is just looking for a little food on a cold winter day. He doesn't believe. And the statue's head turned to face the Eucharist as a sign of the Eucharistic miracle. You know? So there are loads of stories in the medieval period like that. Um, Orvieto in Italy is another uh, place where a Eucharistic miracle happened. So, you know, we're, we're living in a modern scientific world. Miracles are hard for us to figure out as 21st century human beings. But it's interesting, you know, Lourdes in France, they have uh, all these healing miracles. And they have handle doctors, and doctors have to study the healings of the person and attest that there's no known 
way that this person is cured. And so that's how they go about studying and judging such things. So I tend to believe myself that the miraculous work of God is all around us happening all the time. It's a matter of having the eyes of faith to see. And uh, if we have eyes to see, we see it. We have to have, Jesus said, we have to become like children under the kingdom of God. We have to have a, a sense of those things to be aware that God is God. God can act and work in an infinite number of ways in our, in our world and in our universe. So I tend to try not to limit God. So every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we are there at the dying and rising of Jesus. His death and resurrection are here with us every single time we celebrate the Eucharist. And the risen Christ is present in his body, people of God gathered, and the word that is proclaimed, Christ is still speaking to us, and the person of the priest who is presiding and the person of Christ as head of the church, and in, most especially in and through those sacramental uh, sacraments of bread and wine that become the body and blood of Christ. So that is what the Eucharist really is all about. And I think if you remember that core mystery, which the church has always believed for 2,000 years, then you always kind of keep things uh, in the right perspective. Our questions about the Eucharist. That's like, a, we could have a whole class on the Eucharist, right? And spend a whole year on it. I actually did a, an adult faith formation class last semester for several nights, several weeks. And there's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I'll be able to copy up. as a great section on the sacraments, and the section on the Eucharist is very well done. So it's a great place to go back to to read the All right, questions, comments about any of these three sacraments of initiation. We all feel properly prepared to receive these uh, Easter vigil. Okay. Go ahead and go to your tables then. Sure.